Richard Evelink is an American libertarian author, president of uh, the Foundation for Economic Education from 2003 to 2008. Mr. Evelink is currently the BBNT uh, Distinguished Professor of Ethics and uh, Free Enterprise Leadership at the Citadel in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. It is a huge pleasure to have him as our special guest on the show Boom and Bust at Bloomberg TV uh, Bulgaria. Hello. Hello, it is my great pleasure to be with you today. Thank you for being with Our us. Our first question is, have Obama's policy really changed the economy for the better? Uh, what's Mr. Obama's legacy, so to speak? Well, first of all, uh, I would argue that Obama's domestic policies have done the opposite of what you suggested. Rather than making the American economy better, stronger, more productive, wealthier, it has done exactly the reverse. Uh, he entered uh, the presidency telling the American people he wanted to bring about hope and change. Uh, and only it, all that has resulted in is a growth of government uh, regulation, uh, intrusion into people's lives, uh, higher taxes, uh, a stymieing of the free market and the entrepreneurial spirit. It's the reason why, uh, following the uh, financial crisis of 2008 and 2009, when he uh, entered the office of the presidency, uh, the U.S. economic recovery has literally been the slowest in the terms of recovery of output, uh, a growth of a restor restoration of employment, has been the slowest recovery from a uh, significant recession uh, since the end of the Second World War in 1945. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, income has remained significantly stagnant and this from a president who said that he wanted to help the middle class and the poor uh, rise up financially. And in fact, his policies have done exactly the opposite. The other part of your question is, of course, is that what is his legacy? Well, ideologically, his legacy has been to extend uh, the ideology of the belief in government paternalism, the idea that those in political authority know, know better and wiser uh, how to manage your life than you yourself. Uh, his specific programs, such as uh, uh, what is called Obamacare, the imposition of a form of national health insurance and health care in the United States, has been a financial and personal disaster for millions of Americans. It's being proposed by the new Republican Congress and incoming Republican president that it will be the, one of the first things repealed and, and, uh, and done away with. Uh, so in fact, uh, his legacy from the perspective of anyone who has confidence in the dignity and the freedom of the individual and a belief that competitive markets can be more effective in raising standards of living, I would have to say that his legacy, to the extent that there is one, has been the exact opposite of the American tradition of individualism and free enterprise. Mr. Obama entered office as a critique of American foreign uh, policy, but eight years later, what has happened? Well, uh, Obama, as you correctly said, uh, entered the presidency in 2009, uh, arguing that the United States had been following a far too aggressive foreign policy, uh, the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, and so on. Uh, and in fact, what has Obama done? He's uh, continued uh, the war in Afghanistan. There are still American soldiers there. Uh, he, he has exacerbated uh, the, the political and... and uh, and uh, cultural difficulties of Iraq uh, with uh, a continuing informal presence of American forces there and American aid. Uh, he has extended and intensified and made worse the terrible tragedy that is going on in the civil war in Syria uh, through American involvement, both militarily and diplomatically. And of course, he participated with the European countries, particularly the British and the French, to topple uh, Omar Gaddafi's government in Libya. Now, Omar Gaddafi was without a doubt a tyrant, despicable. Uh, as Americans would like to say, he was the kind of fellow you wouldn't want your sister to marry. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, but the fact was, is that they overthrew this fellow. And what has been left in its wake, another example of the law of unintended consequences, has been a disintegration of the political unity of the country, its breakup into uh, religious and uh, tribal divisions that has brought terrible civil war destruction and disaster to the entire population. Uh, he's also extended 
uh, a device of warfare that had begun a bit under Bush, but is uniquely, if you want to put it that way, a legacy of Barack Obama, and that is drone attacks. Uh, he has undertaken drone attacks in seven countries uh, in, in his time in office, Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, uh, Yemen, Somalia, and Libya. And while claiming to be targeting uh, uh, supposedly a known and identified uh, uh, terrorists, they have ended up uh, bombing and killing hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, innocent bystanders, men, women, and children, and in fact have, have targeted American citizens. Uh, when under American law, an American accused of a crime, even a terrible crime, uh, is supposed to uh, be brought, arrested, brought before a court of law, and uh, the court will decide whether he is guilty or innocent, innocent before a punishment is imposed upon him. But the Obama administration, with, 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 with almost like uh, the imagery of a monarch with absolute power, has determined these things on his nearly uh, unique and single discretion. And that, too, is a terrible legacy that Obama has left, because now it's, it's a precedent that has been set for any future president, including the incoming one, um, Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned Donald Trump. Will Trump really change anything about uh, American foreign policy, uh, reconciliation with uh, Russia, tensions with China, etc.? Uh, that, that's really a, a, a major question mark. Uh, let me start out by putting it in, in maybe this context. Uh, there are a number of Americans who have believed that, uh, that Donald Trump is suggesting a return to an American isolationism, that is, American non-participation or involvement in international affairs, both politically, diplomatically, militarily. Uh, and whether you support such uh, American involvement or oppose such involvement uh, has stored a great controversy uh, in the United States. But in fact, uh, Donald Trump has in no way said that he intends to withdraw or even in principle significantly reduce American interventionist uh, political and military involvement in other parts of the world. Uh, he has said that, that the Europeans in, uh, in NATO do not pay, quote, their fair share of the financial cost of the al alliance. So that what he wants is those European participants and members to pay more of the financial burden. Uh, he has said that he wants to renegotiate uh, treaties and arrangements with other allies, uh, as well as with the Russians or the Chinese. Uh, but what he's interested in just having America's place in the world continue with its relative dominance, but on better terms, as he, the great financial negotiator, will try to cut better deals, as he sees it from the United States point of view. It's, it's, it's merely continuation of American foreign involvement around the world only uh, w w with better negotiation on, on the terms of the relationships. So I'm not expecting to see any dramatic shift in America's presence and involvement mm -hmm. and, and often negative effects in international affairs. Let's, uh, let's switch then to economics. Uh, Donald Trump will try to boost American economy through fiscal stimulus such as uh, infrastructure spending and tax cuts. Is this going to work in your mind? Well, we have to take a view of the long run and the short run. It is not uncommon uh, that when such uh, uh, stimulus policies are undertaken, particularly uh, when financed either through uh, uh, deficit spending or through monetary creation, they can have a short-run impact and influence. Uh, seemingly, a miracle has been created. Uh, employment in the aggregate seems often to go up. Output in the aggregate seems to rise. Uh, happy days are here again. Profits are improved. Uh, workers now have uh, sometimes better paying jobs. But this is merely the short run. Uh, in the long run, such policies tend to have uh, negative effects of misdirecting resources, uh, squandering scarce capital, and setting up the stage for an eventual uh, recession when the economy will discover that it cannot be sustained permanently uh, on government artificial stimuluses and must rebalance and, 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 and re-coordinate itself uh, based upon actual resources, uh, savings, investment, and uh, the, the relationships of supply and demand. So uh, we'll see if he, if he introduces what he calls for a trillion dollar stimulus package for what is America called infrastructure, roads, bridges, and so on. 
uh, that he was going to cut taxes, which means that the only way that it can be financed is through additional government borrowing from either foreign or domestic lending sources. And when that becomes tight, then the only other recourse is to turn to the American Central Bank, what's called the Federal Reserve, uh, and either uh, implicitly or explicitly uh, end up funding a lot of that deficit spending through one form or another of monetary creation. And that surely will set the stage for imbalances and distortions that will have to be faced in the future. How about Donald Trump's uh, protectionist trade view? Uh, is he really going to preserve jobs for Americans? What would be the result of uh, such policy? Well, again, it, it's sort of like the illusion uh, from, from, from a, a stimulus package, a fiscal stimulus package. Uh, on the surface, uh, it seems to be, to be co-creating or maintaining jobs. Uh, even before becoming president, uh, Donald Trump has been sort of pressuring a number of American enterprises uh, to uh, not open uh, physical plants uh, and factories in other countries, such as in neighboring Mexico, to keep jobs in America or create jobs in America by investing in the U.S. as opposed to someplace else. But in the long run, this will not increase uh, the number of jobs, nor will it improve the economic situation uh, of the American people as a whole. Uh, what, 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 what Donald Trump seems to fall into are some of the worst misconceptions and fallacies that economists in general, and this includes most economists, both slightly to the left or, or on the right, for 200 years, that international freedom of trade uh, it tends to bring about production being where it is most cost efficient, which means that everyone participating in the trade can have better goods at lower expenses with greater variety. Uh, the fact is, is that, let me give an example. If, if the Ford Motor Company, which uh, uh, Trump has been trying to bully to stay investing with factories in the US, if Ford Motor Company in, opens a factory in Mexico, it's because there are either resource or labor cost advantages. Hmm. So they're able to make cars for less money those good those cars may very well be imported partly or totally back into the united states mm. but that means that those automobiles now can be sold to american automobile consumers at a lower cost now let us suppose that a car i'm just going to pick a number just for the sake of the example would have cost twenty thousand dollars before the arrival of less expensive cars made in mexico and now the the mexican produced cars by the ford motor company is re-imported into the U.S., ready to be sold, and it can be sold, just for the sake of the example, at $15,000. Now, the American consumer gets the car he wants for $15,000 instead of $20,000, and he has $5,000 left in his pocket to spend on, on goods that previously he could not afford, which itself creates profit opportunities and alternative job opportunities consistent with a real rising standard of living for all concerned, both in the United States and those who now have jobs and employment in neighboring Mexico. Okay. Um, there was a uh, little about Ludwig von Mises, your teacher and friend, and what would uh, he have said about the global monetary system if he had been alive? Well, I think that uh, if, if Ludwig von Mises were alive today, uh, for the l listeners, Ludwig von Mises was a very famous Austrian economist uh, who uh, made his major contributions during the middle decades of the 20th century uh, and was a great uh, a critic of both socialism and, and government mismanagement of the monetary system. Uh, he would say that the monetary system today is, is nothing but a disaster uh, uh, in the sense that government has monopoly power to determine how much money will be created, uh, the rate at which will, will be increased and spread into the economy. Uh, it distorts financial markets. Uh, interest rates are supposed to be a price like any other. Hmm. It acts as a balance between the supply of savings and the demand of investors to use resources for capital formation to make more and better goods looking down the road. Uh, and, it, and it's supposed to, to, to assure a balance between uh, the, the amount of resources devoted to making goods in the present and uh, more goods in the future. Now, the Federal Reserve has been manip manipulating interest rates in the United States, and the European Central Bank has been doing the same. 
where in the U.S. interest rates have been practically zero for a decade. Now, that is like setting a price control in any market. And so how do you know what anything is worth? How do you know what the real supply could be? How do you know what people's real demand would be if they were confronted with the fact that there are real real costs to doing things? Now, this means that, that basically the, the financial markets of the United States have been running blind, as if a blindfold has been put over the markets. So we don't know how much savings is really in the economy. We don't know what real profitable investments might have been because they have destroyed the steering mechanism of the, of, the, of the price system in financial markets, interest rates. So f most likely we've had significant investment that is misdirected, uh, uh, extended, uh, wasteful, and all of that will eventually have to be uh, compensated and corrected for down the road. Another way of putting this is that we're setting the stage for an eventual, at some point, another bust following an artificial boom. Exactly in this context, auditing the Federal Reserve, uh, is it a, a pleasurable idea? And of course, why did Trump forget it? Well, uh, you know, that's, that's another interesting question. The, the, the problem is, is, is that it is, it is culturally and politically uh, been so taken for granted now, uh, not just in the United States, but around Europe, uh, either in a country like Great Britain that has its own Bank of England, its own national central bank, or now with the euro, the European central bank, and of course the U.S. for over a century with the Federal Reserve as a central bank, that people cannot any longer imagine a monetary system that is not managed and controlled and, if I'll kind of say this, uh, manipulated by the authorities put in place by governments. And to, to, to imagine a situation in which individuals can decide where they want to bank with private competing banks and in which you would rather than just having the government's artificial paper money uh, it would be some market commodity such as gold chosen by we the people as the most useful advantageous and profitable means of product means of medium of exchange through which we undertake our transactions with greater stability and soundness than the roller coasters of inflations and recessions that central banks have put us through for well over a century now. Mr. Blinky, you have access to Mrs. Archives. Uh, could you tell us more about that? Uh, what can we learn from the past so as uh, not to repeat the same mistakes again and again? Well, it is very interesting. Um, uh, during the Second World War, after Ludwig von Mises came to the United States as an exile from war-torn Europe, uh, he wrote a series of monographs on the idea of how best to bring about economic reconstruction for a war-damaged Europe. And most of his proposals that he presented in 1942, 43, 44, for instance, are still as valid today, even though a devastating war has not struck Europe or any other major part of the world, in the West at least. And that is that the, you must do the following things. You must ground your political economic system on the belief that individuals are the creators of innovation and prosperity, and that the only way you can set loose the creativity of the human mind is to limit government to a set of necessary, perhaps, but limited function, functions, the protection of life and property, and honestly acquired pro, uh, uh, life, liberty, and honestly acquired property, leaving all other matters to the free and voluntary associations and relationships of people in society and the market. You set free innovation. You allow people to have the incentives to work, save, and invest. You, 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 you allow entrepreneurs to rise up and pursue market-created uh, profits uh, to, to find ways to make more goods, better goods, less expensive goods. And you have to base your monetary system uh, on one that is not easily manipulated by governments for their own purposes. It will always be in the short-run interest of politicians who think no further ahead than the next election in which they're trying to be reelected on how to use the power of fiscal policy, taxing and spending, and the monetary printing press to serve their short-run interests at the long-run detriment of the society as a whole. Th those are the type of policies that Mises proposed. That they're the tried and true policies that brought about the industrial transformation of the West 
in the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century that gives all of us, perhaps not equally, but all of us, the quality and the standard of living that we take for granted, which would have been unimaginable, let's say, 100 or 150 years ago. And finally, are you optimistic about the future of sound economic and political ideas? Well, uh, in, uh, I, I'm not optimistic about the short run. Uh, the, the political trends in Europe, uh, the types of policies proposed by a variety of political parties in European countries, uh, the, the, the disastrous policies, in my opinion, of the Barack Obama administration and likely a lot of other bad policies now with Donald Trump. But I believe in the power of ideas. And I believe that there has a, been occurring a renaissance in a rediscovery of the ideas of liberty, uh, of classical liberalism, a respect for the freedom and the dignity of the individual, a belief that the moral foundation of a society is free and voluntary and peaceful association among men, not the coercive arm of government directing or controlling them. And that if that continues, and it's corollary of the belief that freedom can only survive when there is peaceful, competitive free markets, uh, if those trends of a growing number of people in many places in the world uh, appreciating this and influencing others, I think that uh, it is very possible that looking to the decades ahead of the 21st century, we can see a restoration of liberty and freedom and prosperity. Ms. Evelyn, thank you for this wonderful conversation. Wish you all the best. Be safe and mm -hmm. thank you so much. Thank you. It was my thank pleasure. Thank you very, very much.